Amen. Well, I once again get the privilege of speaking to all of you fine folk. And we're just going to go into the word of the Lord here tonight. Psalm 18 is what we're going to. Psalm chapter 18. Starting at verse 1. Pastor's sermon this morning reminded me of my favorite book growing up, besides the Bible, of course. It was a book by Dr. Seuss titled, I Had Trouble in Getting to Sola Salu. And it talked about how I had trouble in getting to Sola Salu on the banks of the beautiful river Wahoo, where they never have any troubles, at least very few. And he goes on this search for this mystical land where they have no trouble. And... Uh, Come to find out he gets there, and they too have trouble. So at the end of the book, he says, I've got a big bat, you see, and now my troubles are going to have troubles with me. <laughs> and uh, it kind of took me back to that. <laughs> Amen. So, <laughs> Psalm 18, verse 1. It says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Amen. How many can testify to that here? My God, my strength in whom I will trust. My buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Isn't he worthy? Amen. Amen. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. I'm just going to speak to you for a few moments here tonight on the topic from victim to victor. From victim to victor. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray that God would have his hand upon the rest of the service. Lord, we are thankful, God, that we get to be in your house here tonight. We pray that you would have your hand upon this word, Lord, that's gone forth. I pray, Jesus, that you would allow it to, God, rest into our spirits here tonight, Lord. I pray, Jesus, that you would challenge us with your word. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name, hallelujah, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. From victim to victor. It's getting cut off a little bit there just by technical difficulty. If you, how many here have heard of the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote? Surely everyone has heard of these famous individuals. <clears throat> Wile E., he had the best laid out plans by far. He invested in the most up-to-date gadgets that he might win the battle. And he always seemed to have the latest gadgets. He always seemed to have these different things that he could utilize in his struggle, if you will, to try to overcome. And uh, yet, number two, yet the best laid plans always backfired on poor old Coyote. They always did. Now, just for a moment here tonight, let's parallel the life of Coyote with our own. First of all, the battle was not, a physic, was not only a physical headache, but a mental headache. Keep in mind, Coyote dealt with defeat every day and sometimes several times a day, and that tends to play on one's mind. And it's in the mind that most of our battles begin. It's in the mind that most of our battles rage. And secondly, Coyote tried to handle things on his own. He tried to do everything on his own power. No matter how many times he failed, he still depended on his wit and will to win the battle. Now, we don't know, but perhaps there were other Coyotes. We don't know. Let's just imagine with me for a moment here tonight. Imagine with me that, of course, Coyotes run in a pack, right? They're usually never alone. And perhaps the other coyotes tried to reason with Wiley and tell him that he needed to seek help. <laughs> but Coyote was far too proud to seek help. This was his battle, and he would win it on his own. 
No one was going to win this battle for him. Number three, I am sure in the beginning old Coyote thought this was no big battle. He had probably caught many birds before, and this was just another day and just another bird. He maybe thought nothing of it at the time. The no big battle theory does nothing but add confidence in our own strength. The bad news is we can identify to all three of these things. Surely I'm not the only one that can. We can all identify. The good news is is that there is a better way. There's a better way. The good news is that there's a way to turn your mourning into dancing. There is a way to turn your sorrow into joy. There is a way to move from victim to victor. First, let's just take a look at the life of David. David the victim. If you've ever read the book, it's an incredible book, The Tale of Three Kings. I won't delve into that book. But it goes into uh, how David is a victim at the start. And in this psalm that he writes here, Psalm 18 and verse 4, he says, The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Here's mighty David, the one that they sang songs about, the one that made an entire kingdom excited and proud. And he's saying that death has surrounded me. He's saying that this battle of his is larger than himself. Too large for himself to overcome. The snares of death prevented me. No matter how you slice it, David was in a heap of trouble. Now, we don't have much problem admitting the victim part. In today's society, everybody is a victim. Either a victim of somebody else's doing or a victim of our own doing, but nevertheless, a victim. And David did not just play the victim role. David decided that he would much rather be the victor than the victim. Now, if you like the victim role, and there are plenty of people that possibly do, then this message is not for you. I'm sorry to say. This message is for those who are tired of fighting a losing battle and want to move from victim to victor. The key is found in verse 6 in this same chapter where he says that the snares of death prevented him that he was compassed about with troubles. In this same chapter, he says in verse 6, in my, dis- in my distress, I called. I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. Two keys tonight from moving from victim to victor. First, there must be a confession of weakness. David, when finding himself in distress, David, when finding himself in a battle, David, when finding his mind being attacked with doubt and defeat, admits that he is weak and cannot defeat the enemy on his own. Now, we do not see that statement of weakness verbatim. We don't see that statement word for word, but I will show you that he is declaring his weakness in just a few moments. What I want us to realize tonight is that the first step from moving from victim to victor is to admit our weakness. Why why must we admit our weakness? What is so important about admitting that we are weak? Because only when we confess our weakness are are we able to possess his strength. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, it says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. We can't do it on our own. We can't come to a place that we're so proud to tell even God, God, I can't do it on my own. We need to come to a place where we say, God, I am weak and you are strong. In my weakness, you are made strong. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ. I, pastor, almost preached my message here this morning. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, 
For when I am weak, then am I strong. Notice the turnaround. Verse 9 said his strength is made perfect. It's made complete. His strength is made complete in my weakness. I like to say it this way. I confess my weakness that I might possess his strength. The reason why a lot of us never move from victim to victor is because we refuse to admit our weakness. We refuse to allow even God to see that we are weak. That we can't win this battle on our own. We are back to the coyote syndrome of, I I can handle it. I can handle this on my own. It is human nature to handle things in our own strength and not to admit we are weak. Because somehow, we have come to believe that weakness is linked to failure. Automatically, just naturally in our human thinking, we automatically think that weakness is linked to failure. But God's way of thinking is not man's way of thinking. Can I get an amen? And God says to admit weakness is to possess my strength. And my strength is not failure, but success guaranteed. So the first key is to confess our weakness but there has to be more than just a confession. In my, distre- in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. David not only admits his weakness, but also pursues God. Cried unto my God. He was pursuing him. He was seeking God. You don't cry out for something unless you're trying to get somebody's attention. Believe me, my two kids, they try to yell over top of each other to get our attention. That's just the way it works. When you're crying out to God, you're trying to get his attention. And this is exactly what David was trying to do. He admits his weakness, but also he pursues God. After the confession, there must be pursuit. Not pursuit of the enemy, but pursuit of God. David realized a very important key in moving from victim to victor. And that is, he was not called to pursue the enemy. None of us are called to to pursue the enemy. But he was called to pursue God and allow God to pursue the enemy. David declared that he was depending upon the Lord to deliver him. And David's dependence on God is found in his pursuit of God. And our dependence on God is found in our pursuit of God. If we are not pursuing him, then we are not depending on him. So simple as that. If you're not pursuing God in the trial that you are in, then you're not depending on Him. We must pursue Him with everything that's in us. Our confession of weakness is only as good as our pursuit of God. We can confess that we're weak, but if we do nothing with it, it has no value. But confessing that we are weak to God And pursuing after him is the key for moving from victim to victor. You can't have one without the other. You can't just go to God and say, fight my battles. I I, I got it almost there for you, Lord. It's just a little ways further. You can do the rest. That's not not how we need to approach it. Our approach needs to be, God, I'm weak. I'm not able to do this on my own. I'm not able to do this on my own strength. I need your help. God, I'm crying out to you. I'm pursuing you, Jesus. David said in Psalm 27, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. God was asking him, seek my face. Seek my face. And he said, my face, Lord, will I seek. We must pursue God with everything that's within us. There are different types of pursuit that really isn't pursuit at all. The word pursuit means to go after with every intention of overtaking whatever it is that one is after. For example, you're playing chase with a child. You don't always pursue. Sometimes you just want to play around and make the child think that you're going to get them. (laughs) Please tell me I'm not the only one that have done that. (laughs) So you're playing hide-and-go-seek with your kid, right? And you say, 10... Nine, eight, seven, eight. <clears throat> Until your wife says, well, aren't you going to go get them? <laughs> that's, that's just playing around. That's not actual pursuit. We can call out to God and the first glimpse of maybe a situation turning around, we say, okay, God, yeah, that's good. And you stop pursuing him. 
That's not real pursuit. That's not real pursuit. This is no game to David. He was a man in hot pursuit of God because the enemy was in hot pursuit of him. David did not intend to get close to God. David intended to pursue him until he caught him. It's the type of pursuit described in Psalm 42 that he describes. As the heart, in other words, the deer, panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul for thee, O God. This is what he was talking about. In other words, just as the deer depends upon the water brook to not only cure his thirst, but to also provide protection, David depends on God to cure his thirst and to provide protection from the enemy. Some may say, oh, so David's scared and he's running from the enemy. But I believe more accurately that it is that God is not running from the enemy, but was running to God. Psalm 18 declares that David, after pursuing God, pursued the enemy and wiped them out. Listen to how many times David refers to the source of his victory. He goes on to say, six, verse 6 and verse 7 says, In my distress I called upon the Lord. And he cried unto my God, he heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even, even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled, the foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken, because he was wroth. Who was he wroth with? He wasn't wroth with David. He was wroth with the enemy. He was angry. He was set ablaze because of what had happened to David. In verse 17, he says, He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. Again, he admits it. They were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. 29, verse 29, it says, For by thee, by God, I have run through a troop. And by my God have I leaped over a wall. Verse 32, he says, it is God that girdeth me with strength. It's God that gives me my strength and maketh my way perfect. I can't do it on my own. Verse 35, it says, thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand have holden me up, and thy gentleness had made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. I have pursued my enemies. He admitted where he was wrong and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rise up against me. David moved from victim to victor because God stepped onto his battlefield. Why did God step onto David's battlefield? Because, first of all, first of all, he admitted that he was weak. Secondly, he pursued after God. He cried out to God. Until he got God's attention, God stepped onto his battlefield. What we need is for God to step onto our battlefield. How many has got a battlefield that they're fighting in their lives? I don't need to have any hands. Things that you've got going on in your life that you've been battling maybe just this week. Maybe it's been for years. Things that you've been battling in your life. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. Seeing then that we have such a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. You can have confidence that God can handle your battle because God has already defeated every enemy that you or I will ever face. Anything that we can ever come in contact with, He's already the victor. Anything that we can ever face in today's day and age, He has already defeated. He has not only defeated your enemy today, but he has also defeated your enemy of tomorrow. There is not a battlefield that will ever come our way that is foreign to God. He is familiar with the enemy. The enemy may catch us by surprise, but never has the enemy been able to sneak up on God and say, surprise. Take comfort to know 
that what you are going through right now is not a surprise to God. It doesn't surprise God that you're going through what you are. He knows exactly where you're at and what you're going through. As Pastor said this morning, you need to be excited about it because it's good. God does things for a reason. God does things for a purpose. He is over your battlefield right now. And he is waiting to step into it, but he will not step into it until he knows that you are going to let him do the leading because God is not into losing. I believe that God steps onto the battlefield the moment we turn loose of our strength and pursue God and his strength. Think about this. The only time Israel was the victim was when they left God. Every single time Israel pursued God before pursuing the enemy, they came out the victor. Why? Because, as I stated earlier, dependence is in the pursuit. We depend on what we pursue or else we would not pursue it. The deer pursues the water brook because it depends upon it for its survival or else it will die. The same is true with us. We will die on the battlefield unless we pursue God. David, he started off with, The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. He starts out with this very dark, dreary, depressed state that he's in. I mean, if you would have just read that statement alone in the psalm, you would have said, well, that's not very encouraging. So I thought psalms were supposed to be uplifting. <laughs> I thought psalms were supposed to be songs of praise. If we would have just read this verse alone, we would have thought this is the end of David. But he concludes this chapter, at the end of this chapter in verse 46, he says, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. He began with a confession of weakness and concluded with a shout of victory. My God reigns. My God lives. Let him be exalted. Let him be lifted high. Let him, hallelujah, Jesus, let him be lifted high. We can move from victim to victor when we confess our weakness and pursue God. We don't have much problem with confession, but pursuit is a whole different issue. The real Pers the reason pursuit of God is so hard is true pursuit makes us focus on one remedy. God refuses to be part of the answer. He will only settle to be the answer. I must pursue him and him only. Just as the deer pursues the water brooks because that is his only hope, so too must we conclude that Jesus Christ is our only hope. In closing, if I could have the music come back. If we could all stand, I'm going to come to a close. I want to ask you a question. When is the last time that you really pursued God? When is the last time that you pursued God as if your life depended upon it? You know why Jarius laid aside his, pos his position in life and pursued Christ and fell at his feet? Because his daughter's life depended upon it. You know why the lady with the issue of blood did not allow a crowd to crowd her out in her pursuit of Christ? Because her healing depended upon it. You know why when told to shut his mouth, blind Bartimaeus cried even louder, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Because his sight depended upon it. Do you know why you need to pursue God like never before? Because your life and your victory Come on now. Your life and your victory depend on it. I am convinced that God is attracted to pursuit. As you begin to move towards him, he will begin to move towards you. That's guaranteed. Are you tired of fighting a losing battle? Then stop and instead start pursuing a victorious God. You want to God to step onto your battlefield, then tonight confess to him your weakness and then possess his strength. Are you ready for God to step onto your battlefield? Just for a moment here tonight, I want you to think 
about your battlefield. Now I want you to make a statement of weakness by coming to the altar. No one excluded. And by coming, you're saying, God, I am pursuing you. I'm coming after you, Lord. I am confessing my weakness that I might possess your strength. I'm nothing without you, Lord. God, only you know what's going on in my life. Only you know, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. It's in you, Lord. It's in you, Lord. God, I'm pursuing after you. You are victorious, God. You've already defeated everything that could be defeated, Lord. You are victorious, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Jesus name. You were always fighting for us. Heavens